Chapter 8. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to deal with Lewis dot structures primarily. We'll also learn a little bit about formal charges, uh, and that's to introduce us to what we're going to talk about in Chapter 9 when we talk about how to draw the different molecules. Uh, next slide. So, next slide. So, this slide is just showing you a basic review of what we already know. Uh, things in the first column or group tend to have an oxidation number of 1, second group is plus 2, third group is plus 3, and then on the other side of the chart, things in the sixth group uh, tend to have an oxidation number of minus 2, seventh minus 1, and eighth would be 0. Uh, so um, all, of, all of these things we've already studied before. That's just kind of uh, summing that back up. Let's move on. Next slide. Okay, forming ionic bonds and electronic configurations. Next slide. Uh, again, this is review. So sodium has uh, a configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. It's the first element in the third row, right? And so it tends to give up the one electron that it has in n equals 3, uh, drops it back to 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, which is an octet. Uh, and so it likes to do that because it wants an octet. Chloride or chlorine tends to gain an electron, so it will go from 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5 to 3p6 by gaining the electron that sodium just gave up. So now we've got sodium with a plus one charge, chlorine with a negative one charge, uh, and they make a lattice. Next slide. So we've talked about this several times. So this is what they're going to produce, a lattice. Uh, the purple spheres are the sodium plus, and they have chloride minuses around them in all four direct all six directions. Next slide. All right, this is uh, maybe the hardest part, uh, I guess, in this chapter. Uh, there's very possibly going to be a question on the final uh, from this. So what this is representing is how we would form what we just saw in the previous slide. In other words, how would we form that lattice? And so the way that they do it so that they can get it down to a mathematical formula is they just assume that you're starting off with, uh, for example, for sodium chloride, uh, you would start off with sodium in its normal form uh, at room temperature, and same thing for chlor chlorine. Uh, well, at room temperature, chlorine would be a gas, and sodium would be a solid. Uh, so what we would have to do is figure out the amount of energy we would have to put into the sodium to take off its outermost electron. And we, you remember from the previous chapter, we call that the ionization energy or the ionization potential. Uh, so we would have to do that. We would have to expend energy to do that. So if you look at the left-hand side of the born Haber cycle, uh, starting with 1, 2, and 3, as you go up, uh, number 1 is we would have to remove, uh, well, actually, we would have to do that for number 3. We would have to remove the outermost electron, and that would require 495.8 kilojoules per mole. Uh, to start at the very beginning, if we start with sodium as a solid, we want to make it into a gas first. Uh, it doesn't really matter which order you do these in, but... Uh, so to make these uh, into a gas, we would have to do what's called sublimation, uh, heat of sublimation, and it's 107.3 kilojoules per mole. And then for the chlorine, uh, it exists as Cl2, not Cl, but we want only one Cl. So we have to split that bond that is holding chlorine to chlorine, right? So that's called the bond dissociation energy. And so we have to do all three of those things, uh, and they all require energy. In other words, to make sodium go from solid to gas, or to split the uh, chlorine 2 into chlorines, or to 
um, make this sodium go to sodium plus. All of those things require energy. Uh, so you'll notice that these red arrows on the left hand side are going up and then they stop after step three. One other thing you may want to notice here is for step two, uh, that is showing you that uh, for one half Cl2 to go to Cl, that's really, um, that's 122 kilojoules for one mole of this to happen. But you have to watch that one because you have to check to see if that's one mole of Cl or one mole of Cl2. Right, so if it's one mole of Cl2, you have to multiply that number by one half. Uh, so if you look at the bottom, it actually does that. Under where it says net reaction, it says uh, Na plus one half Cl2 uh, gives NaCl. Uh, and then that's the overall reaction. <clears throat> so anyway, for step two, I'll tell you in the problem statement, I'll tell you whether you need to multiply by a half or not. Uh, and then move over to the right hand side, step four and five are in blue. They're giving off energy. So remember, we said that when something like chlorine accepts an electron to become chlorine minus, that it actually gives off energy. It's actually more stable that way. Uh, so step four minus 349 kilojoules per mole approximately. Uh, step five, uh, again, when the uh, when this step happens, energy is given off, and it's actually a lot of energy here uh, because uh, this is what happens when sodium plus and chlorine minus come together to form NaCl. That's actually assembling this uh, lattice, and that gives off a lot of energy because it's much more stable to have that lattice than it is to have these separated ions. So that gives off minus 787. So if we sum up the positive terms on the left with the negative terms on the right, uh, we wind up with a net reaction of minus 411 kilojoules per mole. And that's a negative. So that means that there is actually energy given off. Uh, so uh, look for a problem on this on your tests both of them, uh, and uh, be able to just add up, uh, know, what the, know what the steps are called, and be able to add them up. Uh, remember that the, th the three on the left are, are positive numbers, and the two on the right are negative numbers. <clears throat> and the net is when you add all of them together. So what they will probably do on the test is either to just give you steps one through five, uh, and give you the energies for those and ask you what is the net reaction energy. So in that case, it's easy. You just add everything together. Uh, so the three on the left would be positive. So one plus two plus three and then minus four and minus five. But those numbers will already be negative anyway. Uh, one, another thing I need to point out here, another point of confusion. Uh, for some reason, Brown and LeMay refers to number five's energy as a, it would it would refer to it as plus 787 kilojoules per mole. Uh, so you would have to make it into a negative. Just remember that the two things on the right are negative. Add them all together and you get the net reaction. Now the other possibility is they'll give you the net reaction energy uh, along with four of the five other values and then they'll ask you to figure out the fifth one. Now that's a little more challenging. Uh, so you'll just have to set up an equation where you have 1 plus 2 plus 3. So if they didn't give you 3, uh, which would be the ionization energy, then you would have to leave that as an unknown. In other words, you would have to call that x. So it, it would be whatever they give you for 1 and 2 and 4 and 5. And the net rea and the, the, when you add 1 plus 2 plus 3, uh, either uh, like minus 4 minus 5, you would get the net reaction. Okay, so if, if you'll notice here, if you uh, add up these five values, one plus two plus three plus four plus five, four, I'm saying plus four and five, but when, when you add them, you're adding a negative number. So if you want to call it subtracting, that's the same thing. Then you should get minus 411 
Notice under net reaction, it says minus 411. So try that on your own. Uh, and also for step two, uh, whenever you, so let's just add these up very, very quickly. Uh, 107, that's going to be about 229, about 729, uh, 429, um, and then minus about 50 would be about 379, uh, and then minus 780, so that's about 380 and 780, so it would be about uh, minus 400. So what that's telling me is that this value for number two is the way they have it entered there is the way that you would do it. Uh, so they're, they're saying here for number two that that's actually for one mole of CL. What I'm saying is that sometimes the problems will not do that. They'll take uh, a whole mole of CL2 and produce basically two moles of CL and then they'll give you the energy. So in this case, if they had done that, uh, it would have been 244. So you would have to multiply that by one half. So again, I'll tell you that in the problem statement. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here we have all of these values again. So you can just look these over, add them up, and make sure that you're getting minus 411 for the net reaction. So the net reaction is sodium solid plus one half Cl2 gas gives NaCl solid. Next slide. Uh, here are the names for these things for step one. Uh, going from a solid to a gas is called the sublimation energy. Uh, for step two, we call that the bond dissociation energy. Uh, step three is the ionization potential. Four is the electron affinity. And five, we call the, the lattice energy except that Brennan LeMay calls it the negative of the lattice energy, where that would be the positive value. Next slide. Here are some examples of some lattice energies. Uh, this is the amount of energy that you would have to uh, put into it to break up the solid. Uh, and so here are some examples. Uh, so what you would do like for sodium chloride would be to read down the left-hand column to Na plus and then over to Cl minus, and then the value would be uh, 787. Okay, next slide. So just to review again, uh, main group elements tend to undergo reactions that leave them with eight outer shell electrons. So uh, we've been saying this all semester. We call this the octet rule. They want an octet. Now again, uh, let me point something out to you. Actually, not again, but uh, look at the top uh, sentence. It says main group. So that means things in either the first two columns or the last six columns. Remember, those represent the S orbitals and the P suborbitals. <clears throat> but things in the transition metals uh, don't tend to necessarily go this way. So you, when you get into the transition metals, uh, you can't really go by this octet rule, but we don't really deal with the transition metals that much anyway. Next slide. Uh, and then this is also saying that metals tend to have low ionization potentials. In other words, easy to remove their outermost electrons. And they have low electron affinities uh, because they don't really want any more electrons. Non-metals, it would be just the opposite. It would be hard to remove their outermost electron, and they have high electron affinities. Next slide. Okay, here is another slide showing in blue on the right-hand side of the chart. Those things that are in blue are below the second row in the chart, which means that uh, we haven't talked about this before but they can accept more than eight electrons, like particularly uh, the examples that we'll use will deal with things like uh, phosphorus and sulfur. So phosphorus and sulfur can take more than eight electrons. Uh, they can take up to 10 or 12. And the reason is because they have more suborbitals available to them for bonding purposes. So like 
Uh, for example, in the third row, we don't just have S and P. We also have a 3D. Now, it's not listed here on this chart. It, it's shown down in the fourth row. I'm talking about scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and so forth. That's actually, though, the 3D. It's in the third main shell. So there, all, all of those are available to things in the third row, like phosphorus or sulfur, uh, which means that they can do what we call expand octet. Uh, they can take more than eight electrons. Now, that doesn't really violate the octet rule. It's just an exception to the octet rules. We're still in the main group elements. So, uh, for example, phosphorus could take 10 uh, electrons in its outermost shell. Uh, so it can go up to 10, whereas like nitrogen right above it can only take 8. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so if you'll just look down at the very bottom line, uh, it, I'm just going to read it. The octet rule, although useful, is clearly limited in scope. So what they're basically saying here is that it doesn't really apply to the transition metals, the things in the middle of the chart. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so periodic uh, uh, trends we studied in Chapter 7. Uh, we talked about the ionization potential and the electron affinity and the atomic size. So the only one that we didn't talk about was the electron negativity. We mentioned it briefly. Uh, so uh, I've listed at the very bottom of the slide, it says electron negativity was originally simply calculated as the average of the electron affinity and the ionization potential. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So electron negativity is the one that we use the most out of all of those. <clears throat> it's a measure of the attraction between a nucleus and electrons or electron density. Uh, so the way that we do it now is that we measure it on what's called the, the, the Pauling scale, uh, which starts at zero if you have no electronegativity and goes up to four. So the most electronegative element would be at four. Uh, so you can actually find charts that show the numbers for each atom. Uh, so it turns out that <coughs> fluorine is the one that is the most electronegative. So that means that it has the greatest ability to draw electrons to itself. Uh, so fluorine is the most electronegative, and rubidium is the least. Uh, fluorine is 4. Uh, rubidium, I believe, is 0 0.7. Rubidium is at the bottom left of the chart, whereas fluorine is at the top right. Next slide. So. Basically, uh, it's easier to see this if we're looking at a chart, but um, as you go from the bottom left to the top right of the chart, electronegativity will increase. So uh, starting at francium or <clears throat> rubidium at the bottom left and going up to fluorine at the top right, it will go, it will increase as you go up the chart or as you go from left to right. Uh, the least electronegative is actually francium. Uh, rubidium is just above that. Some of the charts that we look at don't show francium, so that's why I said rubidium, but uh, they're right next to each other and they're almost the same. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a couple of rules of thumb we can look at at this. Next slide. Uh, so here you can see it a little more easily. Uh, rubidium and cesium down at the bottom left-hand side are the least, and francium isn't shown here, uh, but it's actually below cesium, uh, so that's why I didn't mention it before, because it's off this chart, but uh, it's actually 0.7 as well, so those three uh, are all about the same. So look at the chart. As you move to the right, notice the values get larger. And then as you go up each column, the values basically get larger. So uh, it increases as you either go from left to right or as you go from bottom to top of the chart. Uh, 
Another thing you should notice is that hydrogen is kind of anomalous. So if you think of hydrogen as being kind of like moved over to the right above boron, that's about where it would be as far as its electronegativity. It's about to. It's 2.1, but it's about to. It might be helpful if you can remember that hydrogen is about two. And if you can also remember that if you start at fluorine, it's four. And then every time you move one element to the left, like if you move to oxygen and then to nitrogen and then to carbon uh, and then to boron, it drops by one half. So by the time you get to boron, you're at about the same level as hydrogen. Uh, also, notice that for fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, as you uh, move down one row, it drops by about, a, by about a value of one. So fluorine to chlorine drops from four to three and so forth. That doesn't happen through the whole chart, just in that particular area, but it turns out that that area is usually the area that we're most concerned with. Next slide. Okay, so having said that about electronegativity, there are two major types of bonds, covalent and ionic. Covalent bonds can be further broken down into two major categories. So uh, uh, for covalent bonds, we actually have two different kinds of covalent bonds. So really the main two types of bonds are covalent and ionic, but some of the covalent bonds are kind of like uh, what we call polar covalent, and the example of that would be water. So even though they, they are not ionic, they have partial positive charges and partial negative charges. Uh, so water is polar, so it doesn't have a full positive or negative charge like an ionic bond, but it does have partial positives. So we can kind of consider that to be uh, halfway in, in a sense between covalent and ionic. So next slide. So ionic bonds involve a complete transfer of an electron uh, and they form lattices. Next slide. Uh, so what we can do is we can look at the difference in electronegativity like we just saw on that chart a few seconds ago where we saw the numerical values that were attached to each atom, like the four for the fluorine. So if we look at the two things that are involved in the bond, like for example, water and oxygen. Up in uh, water, we have oxygen and, uh, sorry, hydrogen combined. Hydrogen was 2.1, water, uh, sorry, oxygen <clears throat> was 3.5. So we call that uh, a polar bond, even though it's still considered to be covalent. Uh, the difference between 3.5 and 2.1 is 1.4. So if you'll look down at the bottom of the slide, uh, between 0 0.5 and 2.0, which that would include water, then we say that the bond is polar covalent. So notice here they're using these values from that chart to figure this stuff out. So if you have, for example, uh, remember um, fluorine and the one right next to it, which was oxygen, were different by 0.5, right? Remember we said that as we go from right to left across the top there, at the top right at least, it was 0 0.5. So, or if you go, the difference between N and O would be 0 0.5. So, I mean, that's right on the border here. If you look at the bottom where it says less than 0 0.5, <clears throat> that would be kind of like uh, right on the border between being nonpolar and polar covalent. And then they say that if it's more than two, the bond is ionic. Okay, but when you're taking a test, you can't look at that chart. So the easiest way to remember some of these is that if you look at the bottom where it says more than 2.0, the bond is ionic. For your purposes, I mean, you would have to just see that two things are way across from each other on the chart. But it's maybe a little bit easier if you just remember that ionic bonds are going to be between a metal and a non-metal. So if you're asked on a test, uh, 
uh, is this ionic or not, then you can just say, is it uh, a metal with a non-metal, or is it two non-metals? So if it's two non-metals, then it's going to be covalent. That still won't tell you whether it's uh, polar covalent or nonpolar, uh, but it will tell you that it is not ionic. So when you're talking about ionic bonds, you're talking about sodium chloride or sodium fluoride or something like that. <coughs> Uh, so that's what you should watch for. So you have three categories. So if they ask on a test to get the ones that are ionic, look for something that's a metal and a non-metal. Uh, and then for the top one, if it's less than 0 0.5, look for things that are the same thing, like chlorine and chlorine, or bromine and bromine, Br2. Uh, things that it's the same thing on both sides, or like H2. Those are going to be nonpolar covalent. I mean, those are the only ones that you really probably will know for sure. Uh, if it were something like NO, where they're right next to each other, it's on the borderline. So it's going to depend on whoever wrote the test and what they're defining. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got allergies. Uh, what they're defining to be nonpolar and, and polar. Uh, so you'll just have to take your best guess. Uh, but... Uh, when I do the tests, I try to make them straightforward. So if I'm asking for something nonpolar covalent, I'll, I'll, I'll make it where it's like H2 or Br2. But on the final exam, you never know. Next slide. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> I'm sorry. All right, so um, we can look at this as a kind of what we would call a continuum. Uh, continuum is where you go from one extreme to the other. So what we've just talked about, we can look at that way. Uh, at one side, we have something that's fully ionic, where you have full plus and minus charges. On the other extreme, at the right-hand side, you have nonpolar covalent, which means that you've got something like Br2, where there's equal sharing. And then in the middle would be something like water or ammonia, where you have like uh, one element is drawing the electrons more closely to itself. So in the middle where it says polar covalent, the X would be either oxygen or nitrogen or something like that, or fluorine. And the Y would be like hydrogen. So the hydrogen would be partially positive and the oxygen or whatever would be partially negative. Next slide. So a co covalent bond is a bond the results from sharing of electrons. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, all right, so now moving to bond association energy. Uh, this is a measure of how strong a bond is. It's the amount of energy you would have to put into, for example, H2 or Br2 to break the bond between them. Uh, it can be any bond. So we have some problems that are very easy to do as long as you remember the little rule. Next slide. Uh, here are some examples. So the rule is that um, when you're calculating a reaction energy using these bond association energies, you do reactants minus products. In other words, you figure out all the bonds in the reactants, and it has to be all the reactants, and then subtract all the energies for the bonds in the products. <clears throat> so the simplest example would be if you take HH and then break it up into H plus H, then reactants minus products would be 436 minus 0 because the, the products don't have any bonds. Uh, for H2O, uh, if you were, well, that's not a good example. Uh, if you wanted to do H plus plus OH minus gives H2O, then you would take the energy for the H plus, which is zero because you don't have a bond. The energy for OH is, if you look over in the one, two, three, fourth column at the top, it's 460. Um, and then it would be producing H2O. Uh, so that would have two OH bonds. So that would be 460 times two. So you would be subtracting basically 460 minus 2 times 460, which would be negative 460. Okay, so anyway, that's basically how you do this.
Uh, we'll do a few examples, so hopefully this will become clear to you. Next slide. So if you look at the second line, it says delta H is the summation of the uh, bond dissociation energies for the reactants minus the summation of the bond dissociation energies for the products. It's reactants minus products. <clears throat> and I should point out here that this is the only time in the whole class where it will be this way. It's almost always the opposite, right? So uh, for delta H's, if we're using the enthalpies, we do products minus reactants. It's And then there are other instances when we do, uh, re, uh, sorry, products minus reactants. This is the only time where it's the opposite. So just try to remember if they give you the bond dissociation energies, uh, you're doing it reactants minus products. And that's because in this particular kind of problem, we're not breaking bonds. We're actually, or I'm, I'm sorry, we're not forming bonds. We're actually breaking bonds. So we switch it around and we say reactants minus products. Next slide. So here's an example. Uh, H2 plus Cl2 gives two HCLs. So we want reactants minus products. Uh, so we would look back at that chart, which I can't do. Uh, find the energy for H2. And that was 436 kilojoules per mole. And there's one of the H2s. So we only multiply that by one. And then plus the bond energy for Cl, Cl, which was 243. Again, there's one of those. So we multiply that by one. And then we subtract the bond energy for HCl, which was 432. Uh, but we have to multiply that by 2 because there's a 2 coefficient in front of the HCl. So it's going to be 436 plus 243 minus 2 times 432. And just add that up. So, I mean, it, it may take a second or two to get used to this, but once you see how to do these, they're really easy. Uh, next slide. So here's another example that you can do. Uh, why don't you try to do it on your own before you flip the slide? Uh, one thing that's a little confusing about this one is trying to figure out what bonds are present uh, in the reactant and the product here. There's one reactant and one product. So uh, on both sides, we have an N triple bonded to a C. So that's 891. So you can really leave that one out because it's in both of them, or you can put it in if you want. And then on the left, we have an N that is bonded to a C. Uh, and then the C is bonded to three H's. So this is a little bit of an unusual molecule uh, because N usually doesn't take more than three bonds. Uh, here it, it, it is on the left. So uh, the way that that is, is there's a bond between a C and an N, a single bond, and then there are three bonds between the carbon and hydrogen. Uh, on the right-hand side, again, you have the three bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen, uh, and then you have a bond, a single bond between carbon and carbon. So the three bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen are the same on both sides also. So you can leave those out if you want to. So really, the difference between the left and the right is on the left, we have a carbon-nitrogen bond, which is 305. And on the right, we have a carbon-carbon bond, which is 347. So basically, we want to subtract 305 minus 347. Now, you can also do it with all the bonds, and it would be good practice to do that. Next slide. Uh, next slide. I think what happened is that somehow uh, the answer got left off of this slide. Uh, next slide. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, 305 minus 347 uh, gives you negative 42, which is what we said. Um, or you could have added up everything on the left and everything on the right and gotten the same answer. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Uh, so I'm going to have to try to speed up a little bit uh, because I don't want this to go too long either for your sake or mine. Uh, 
uh, for the video's sake. Uh, so this slide we're just going to very briefly mention, and we'll see a picture of it on the next slide, that as you go from a single bond to a, a double bond to a triple bond on those carbons in the, in the middle there, that notice that the bond length becomes shorter and the strength of the bond becomes greater. So a carbon carbon single bond is longer than a double bond, which is longer than a, a triple bond. <clears throat> a single bond is not as strong as a double bond, which is not as strong as a triple bond. Next slide. And here is a picture of it. Uh, so the links are going across the x-axis. So the longest one is the single bond. In the middle is the double bond. And the shortest is the triple bond. And the strength is shown on the y-axis. Uh, the weakest is the single bond. And then the middle is the double bond. And then the strongest is the triple bond. Next. Next. Uh, uh, electric field, uh, the effect that it has on polar molecules is that whenever you turn on the electric field uh, or a magnetic field, um, the pos positive ends of the molecules line up as uh, opposed to the negative terminal and the negative ends line up against the positive terminal. So you'll notice on the left hand side of this, A, uh, everything is just randomly oriented. But when you turn on the electric field, everything lines up the same way. Next slide. Uh, and then this is just a kind of a rehash what we said before. We can have either fully ionic on the left, or we can have fully covalent on the right. Or in the middle, we can have polar covalent. Next. A concept check. If lithium and fluorine react, which has more attraction for an electron? <clears throat> so remember back from our chart, uh, lithium is at kind of the far left-hand side. Uh, fluorine is the most electronegative on the far right and at the top. So fluorine is going to clearly be more electronegative. It will have more attraction. So if you have a bond between fluorine and iodine, which would have more attraction for an electron? Again, the answer would be fluorine because it's in this case, it's because it's higher up in the chart. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, and then let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So what is the, uh, another concept check, what is the general trend for electronegativity across rows and down columns? Uh, the trend is that as you go from left to right across the chart, electronegativity increases. And as you go from the bottom to the top of a column, electronegativity increases. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so which of the following bonds would be most polar without being considered ionic? So to be considered ionic, uh, you would have to be more than two. Um, I've only got, I've, I've got the numbers listed for three of these because there are two of them you can see uh, what they are, right? So um, if you look at this second row, there are five different things listed there, but magnesium is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal, so that's clearly going to be ionic, right? So that's something that I want you to be sure you, you, you see. Uh, you, you have a metal and a non-metal, so you know that's going to be ionic. You don't have to know the numbers. And then also for OO in the middle, uh, that is going to clearly be nonpolar because the, the two O's both have the same amount of electronegativity, so they draw the electrons with the same force. Uh, so that removes those two things from consideration. We're looking for which one is polar covalent and is the most polar. So it is going to have to be between C and O silicon and O or nitrogen and O. And so to make this easier for you, I, I listed the values below. CO is 1, SiO is 1.7, and NO is 0.5. So all you have to do is look at those three values, which of those is the largest, and it's going to be SiO. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide.
So the localized electron model, a molecule is composed of atoms that are bound together by sharing pairs of electrons using the atomic orbitals of the bound atoms. Next slide. All right, so now we're going to start talking about uh, the different ways we can show uh, models of molecules. Uh, so the, we call this the localized electron model. And in this chapter, we're going to start off by talking about Lewis dot structures, which is like the easiest way to try to draw what they look like. But it's not real, real helpful in three dimensions, but it's a good thing to start with. And we can learn a lot from these Lewis dot structures. So notice at the bottom, uh, whenever we have electron pairs, they're going to be either in a bond. All bonds have two electrons, whether they're single or double or triple. If you have a double bond, you just have two bonds. But they both, each of those two bonds will have two electrons. Uh, or you, they're going to be also uh, arranged in some cases in what we call lone pairs. A lone pair is just a pair of electrons that just kind of like sticks off of an atom. Uh, next slide. So the ways to describe these different uh, uh, arrangements, uh, we can draw the Lewis dot structure, which is what we're going to do in this chapter. Uh, or in the, it, we'll do this in the next chapter. We can use the VSEPR model, or we can use the valence bond model, or we can use molecular orbital theory. So all three of those things we'll do in chapter 9. Next slide. The Lewis dot structures show how valence electrons are arranged among atoms in a molecule. Uh, and it reflects the central idea that stability is related to a noble gas configuration. Next slide. So elements will form stable molecules when they're surrounded by eight electrons. For example, when you have F2, each of the Fs has seven electrons. Uh, so when they come together, they make a single bond. And uh, two of the electrons are between the two Fs, which we consider them to belong to both Fs. So the two in the middle are considered to belong to both Fs. And then uh, the other six on each F are to each of the different Fs. So six plus two is eight for each of those. Next slide. For H, we don't have an octet. We have a duet. But it's got the same effect. It's stable. So each of the electrons on the two H's uh, centers itself between the two H's. And uh, that makes that there are two electrons between the two H's. And they're considered to belong to each H. So each H is considered to have two electrons. Uh, next slide. Uh, double bonds mean that you have two pair of electrons between the two um, atoms. So each of the O's has a double bond to C in carbon dioxide. Uh, so you have a total of four electrons between the C and the O on the left and the C and the O on the right. Uh, next slide. And then when you have a triple bond, it's just three pairs of electrons, like NN. So the NN that floats around in the air <coughs> has a triple bond between the two ends. So if you have H2 gas, it's got a single bond. O2 gas has a double bond, and N2 gas has a triple bond. Oh, I forgot to say next. All right, so to do Lewis dot structures, uh, here are the steps. First of all, sum the valence electrons from all the atoms. In other words, just count over what column it's in. If it's H, it's 1. If it's O, it's 6. If it's N, it's 5. If it's F, it's 7. So just do, do all of them that same way. Uh, so that's the number of valence electrons it has. Uh, and then <clears throat> write the atoms of the molecule such that you have one in the middle and then the other ones attached to it. And then draw a line between each of them. And you'll be using up two electrons for each line. And then uh, usually what you'll do is if you have electrons that are left over, then you assign them to the atoms that are on the outside, not the one in the middle. And then if you have any left over after you do that, you put them on the one in the middle. Next slide. So for H2O, sum the valence electrons from all the atoms. Well, H has one and O has six. 
So 6 plus 1 plus 1 is 8 total. Next. So write uh, O and then put an H on each side. Um, and then draw a line between each H and the O. And realize that when you draw each line, you're using two electrons. Uh, so you're going to wind up with four electrons that you used to draw those two lines. But you started with eight, so you still have four left over. Next slide. Uh, so here we see that we've used four of those eight. So we started with eight electrons and we've used four. That means we have four left. Ordinarily, what you would do would be to put those four electrons on the H's because those are what we call the terminal atoms. They're the ones on the outside. But we can't do that in this case because H can only take two. So we have no choice in this case but to go ahead and put all four of those on the O in the middle. So we just put two long pairs on the O. Next slide. Uh, atoms usually have noble gas configurations. Arrange the remaining atoms, uh, sorry, the remaining electrons to satisfy the octet rule or duet rule for hydrogen, first assigning electrons to the terminal atoms, which we didn't do that in the previous example because we couldn't. Uh, so for H2O, we put the electrons on the O. So O is going to have what we call two long pairs. Next slide. So there is the way it will look when you're finished with your Lewis dot structure. Uh, you have the O in the middle with two H's on either side, uh, one H on either side. And then you have one line drawn between the O and the H's. And then you have two electrons on top of O and two on the bottom. And that's the finished product right there. We've used all eight electrons, if you count them, two in each of the bonds and two in each of the lone pairs. And that's how many we started with, so we've used all of them up. All right, so for the next one, P, B, R, 3, you have to figure out how many valence electrons P and B, R have. So P turns out to have five since it's in the fifth column, and B, R being in the seventh column will have seven. But we have three B, R, so three times seven is 21. Uh, and then add 5, and that's 26. So whenever you have a situation like PBR3, the P goes in the middle, right? Uh, so you're going to have a P in the middle with three BRs around it. So to my knowledge, every problem you'll get this whole semester where you have anything where it's like PBR3, the thing that's there's only one of them goes in the middle. So draw a P in the middle and draw three BRs around the P, and then draw a line between each of the BRs and the P. Okay, so let's figure out, we, we have three times seven is 21. 21 plus five for the P is 26. So we're starting off with 26 electrons, and we'll use six of those to draw the three lines. So that leaves 20. Then we wanna put as many as we can on the BRs because they're the ones on the outside. They're the terminal atoms. But we can only put a maximum of six on each BR. So that means we can only put three times six, which is 18, on those three BRs. So that means two will be left over. So those have to go on the P. So that means that P has to have a lone pair on it. And then we're finished, basically. So next slide. So this is what the finished product is going to look like. All right, now the next one is HCN. So H is 1, C is 4, N is 5. 5 plus 4 plus 1 is 10. We start with 10, and in this case, I'll just tell you that C will be in the middle, H on the left, and N on the right. So draw a line between H and C, and then draw another line between C and N, and you have used up four electrons. Uh, you started with 10, so you have 6 left. You can't put any of those on H, so put all of them on N to start with anyway. But then if you look at it, and let me go to the next slide here. Okay, so uh, look down where it says HCN, uh, H-C-N. <clears throat> we started with 10 electrons, and we've used 4, so we have 6 left over. 
so first of all, put all of them on the end, and that's shown down at like the third to the last row. But if you look at the carbon in the middle, it doesn't have an octet. So that's something that you'll have to watch for. So in order to give it an octet, we have to take some of the electrons on the end, and we don't actually move them over to the C, but we flip them so that that makes another bond between the N and the C. And we're going to have to actually do that twice, because if we just do it one time, we'll only still have um, two, four, six electrons around the C. So we have to take four of those six electrons on the end and flip them to make extra bonds between the C and the N. So at the end, we end up with uh, three bonds between C and N, one bond between C and H, and then we'll still have two electrons that are a lone pair on N. Next slide. So that's what it looks like. Okay, so you'll have to watch every time you do one of these, you have to check, you have to remember uh, to see if the central atom has an octet. And if it does not have an octet, you have to flip electrons over to it by making bonds between it and the thing next to it. Next slide. <coughs> Okay, so for H, it's very simple. Uh, just uh, We have two H's, each of which has one electron. Uh, so just put the two electrons between the two H's, and that represents one bond, a single bond. Uh, and each of those H's is considered to have or share both of those electrons. So that is considered to be a duet, and it's stable. Next slide. All right, so if you'll notice here, uh, we're going from methane to ammonia to water to HF. We're starting in the column with carbon, so that's the fourth column. Uh, and then N is in the fifth, O in the sixth, and F in the seventh column. So this is a little rule that you can try to remember. It will help you. Carbon in the fourth column will have no lone pairs and four bonds. Move over to the next column, the fifth column. Nitrogen and the things below it will tend to make three bonds and have one lone pair. Uh, move over to the next column, six column. Water, six valence electrons, they tend to uh, make two bonds, and that uh, will leave two, four electrons that are arranged as lone pairs. Uh, and then for HF, you have one bond and three lone pairs. Okay, so back to the left. Uh, just to review, I'm going to read from left to right. We have uh, from the left four bonds, no lone pairs, uh, three bonds, one lone pair, two bonds, two lone pairs, and one bond, three lone pairs. Uh, and that's the way that these four things always do work in the second row. So C, N, O, F always work this way. If you go down one more row, uh, silicon will tend to be the same as carbon. But uh, phosphorus can be the same as nitrogen uh, in the fifth column. Uh, but phosphorus, because it's below the second row, can also have the situation where it can actually make five bonds. Nitrogen cannot do that, but phosphorus can. Uh, and then, uh, so, so if you can remember this little pattern, uh, if you start from the fourth column and go over to the seventh, actually, you can take it one step further and go to the eighth column, uh, it goes, in terms of the number of lone pairs, it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, and then not shown would be 4 on whatever the, uh, it would be neon. Neon would just be 4 lone pairs. Next slide. Uh, for fluorine, we have, uh, fluorine is in the seventh column, it has seven valence electrons, uh, so it has, uh, a total here for F2 of 7 plus 7 is 14 electrons. So draw your two Fs beside each other. Draw a line between them. Uh, that uses two of the 14, and that leaves 12, of which now we want to put as many as we can on the two Fs. And we can put six on each F. Six is the maximum you can typically put on terminal atoms. So we put six on one F and six on the other F, and we're finished.
Uh, so th you can either draw a line between the two Fs or you can do it the way they did here where they took two dots. Uh, for O, uh, six valence electrons, two would be 12. So draw the two O's, draw a line between them, put um, that would use two, that leaves 10. Uh, so put six on one and four on the other. And then in that case, um, the one that has only four doesn't have an octet. So you'll have to kind of sketch this out. But um, so you have to flip one of the lone pairs from the one that has six electrons around it. You have to flip two of those electrons between the two O's to make a double bond. So if you didn't catch what I said, just draw these out the way we've been doing them and see for yourself. You'll wind up with a single bond originally between the two O's and one O will have four and one will have six electrons. But you can't leave it that way because the one that has four electrons doesn't have an octet. And then it's going to be the same thing for N. So for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm trying to get through this. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so here they're drawing the Lewis dot structure for H2O, uh, which we've already done that. So we added them up. Uh, we got eight valence electrons. Uh, we drew O in the middle with H's on each side, drew a line between each of the H's and the O. That used four of the eight. That leaves four. We first try to put them on the H's because those are the terminal atoms, but we can't do that because that's H. H can't take any more uh, electrons, so you have to put them on the O. So put four on the O and you're finished. Next slide. All right, here's one we haven't done yet. Carbon tetrachloride. Chlorine is in the seventh column. Carbon's in the fourth column. Four times seven is 28. 28 plus four is 32. Uh, so draw, again, this is another example of where you have one of one thing and three or four of something else. So the thing that you have only one of goes in the middle. So put the C in the middle, uh, put the chlorines around it, one, two, three, four chlorines, and then draw a line between each chlorine and the carbon. You've used two, four, six, eight electrons in drawing those lines, uh, but you started with 32. So 32 minus eight is 24 that are left over. So put as many as you can on the four chlorines. Uh, you can put six on each chlorine. So four times six is 24. Uh, so that's all we have left. So we've used them all up. And so over on the right hand side, we see the finished product. So that's the answer. So if you were asked on a test, which you will be, uh, to draw the Lewis dot structure for CCL4, uh, then uh, that's what you would wind up with on the right hand side. Next. Uh, CH2O, carbon is 4, H is 1, O is 6, so uh, 4 plus 2 plus 6 is 12, 12 valence electrons. Uh, in this case, the C will be in the middle. O is almost never in the middle except if it's water. Uh, so put the C in the middle, uh, draw the H's and the O around it, and draw a line between them. And that will use two, four, six electrons of the 12. Uh, so there are going to be six left over. So you can't put any of them on the H's, but you can put all six of them on the O. Uh, so do that in step three, put the six electrons on the O. But there's a problem there. If you look at the C in step three, it doesn't have an octet. It needs two more electrons. So we have to flip two of those electrons off the O to make another bond between the O and the C. So step five, uh, we skip step four. So step five, uh, make another bond between the C and the O. So now we have a double bond between the C and the O. Now the carbon does have an octet, uh, two, four, six, eight electrons around it. So down at the bottom right is your finished product. And you still have two lone pairs on the O. Typically, we almost always want O to have two lone pairs. Next slide. Okay, for some uh, things, we can draw more than one Lewis dot structure that will work. Uh, so if you look for carbon dioxide here, look at those two blue boxes. 
for one of them, carbon has two double bonds with O's. The other, it has a single bond on one side and the triple bond on the other side. And they're both legitimate because uh, we've used up all the electrons for both of them. And also, uh, we have an octet on carbon for both of them. So check that to make sure you understand that. <clears throat> However, the one on the left is going to be more stable, and that means that most of the time CO2 will be like the structure on the left. So this is a situation where there's a preference. Uh, it could be the way it is on the right, and maybe occasionally it will be the way it is on the right, but probably 99% of the time it'll be the way it is on the left. So how would you be able to know which one of them would be the correct structure? you do what's called a formal charge, which we haven't talked about that yet. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. Uh, but to do the formal charges, uh, if you do them on both of these structures, you see that for the left-hand structure, you get zeros. On the right, you get minus one, zero, and plus one. So if you have a choice like this, you choose the one that has the zeros. You want the one that has zero formal charges. Uh, because it's more stable than the one that has the charges. Next slide. Uh, so look at number one. Uh, the dominant Lewis structure will be the one in which the atoms have the formal charges that are closest to zero. And number two, a Lewis structure in which any negative charges reside will usually have the negative charge on the thing, the atom that is most electronegative. That tends to make it more stable. Next slide. Exceptions to the octet rule. Next slide. Uh, we've already talked about this. Boron can't make an octet because it isn't large enough. So it will tend to make uh, things that have only three bonds around it, which means it will only have six electrons around it. But for boron, it, it's okay with that. It, it, it's fine uh, because there's no way that it can take an octet, at least not when it makes a molecule like this. Uh, next slide. Beryllium is the same way. Beryllium tends to make uh, only two bonds, and that's all it can really do uh, in terms of making molecules. So uh, it will tend to have only four electrons around it. And again, for beryllium, that's okay. Uh, so these are exceptions to the octet rule. Next slide. Uh, and then we've already talked about this. Whenever uh, we get down in the third row or below, uh, in the examples you see below here are sulfur and arsenic, uh, they can take more than eight electrons. So notice here the sulfur is taking 10, and the arsenic is also taking 10. Uh, so they can take that, they can take more than eight because they're below the second row. Next slide. So to quickly review, uh, C and O and F should always be assumed to obey the octet rule. Uh, B and BA, BE will take fewer than eight electrons, and the third row elements can take more than eight electrons. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay, now this is not the same thing we were just dealing with a moment ago with the CO2. There's a slight difference here. So uh, I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time because we're already over an hour. Uh, but when you have ozone or O3, uh, it turns out that there are two equivalent structures that you can do, which we, we, we can't see them here. Uh, we'll see them on the next slide. Uh, but it's not the same thing as CO2. For CO2, one of those two structures we saw, the one that had double bonds on both sides, was more stable than the other one. So almost all of the time, CO2 will almost always exist that way. So that wasn't what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here, like I'm not going to go through all the steps. I'll let that be for you for an exercise. But if we do O3, we start with 18 electrons. And if we do it the same steps that we did before, we end up with what we see in step five here. Um, we end up with a double bond between one of the O's on the end and the central O. But which one? Uh, so we'll flip in just a moment to the next slide. I'll let you look at this to see how they did the steps. But uh, the question is, is it going to be between the O on the left or the one on the right? Uh, 
and there's no difference. So this is not like CO2. Here, there's no difference between if we choose the one on the left or the one on the right, because if we do the formal charges, they're going to be the same. So when we have a situation where there's no difference, we call that resonance. Next slide. So look at the bottom. Uh, you see two different structures with a double-headed arrow between them. Uh, the one on the left has the double bond on the left side. The one on the right has the double bond on the, the right. They're equivalent. They're absolutely equivalent. So there's really no difference between them. The formal charges will be the same. Um, so when you have that situation where you have two or more equivalent structures with the same formal charges, then you call that resonance. Next slide. Uh, here's another example. When you have NO3, you actually have three different possibilities. All of them are the same, and they all have the same formal charges. So I mean, none of them is preferred. They're all equally possible. So when you have that, you have resonance. Next slide. And this is actually what it looks like. Uh, the, so those electrons that are shown in the lines between the N's and the O's, or the N and the O's, are actually bonded electrons, uh, so they can't move. They're localized. But the things that are shown in the kind of like, uh, I don't know what color that is, uh, kind of like almost like a brick red, above and below the NO3 molecule, those are delocalized. Uh, so that means they can actually move around, and they do. So they uh, spread themselves out equally over the top and the bottom of those. So that's what actually happens with resonance. Uh, the structure on the right is the way it actually would look. So when you have resonance, you have, by definition, you have delocalized uh, electrons that are moving around on top and on bottom of the molecule. Next slide. So let's talk about formal charges. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. I'm, I'm trying to go ahead and get to this. So. Uh, to do the formal charge, what you want to do, first of all, you want to see what column the atom is in and see how many electrons it would have normally. In other words, just the normal normal valence number of electrons. Like, for example, carbon would normally be 4, nitrogen would be 5, O would be 6, and so forth. Uh, and then you subtract the number of electrons that are around it. But there are two different ways they can be around it. They can either be around it as a lone pair, or they can be around it as a bond. <clears throat> so the way that we do it for this purpose only is if it's in a bond, we only assign half of the electrons in the bond to the atom on one side and half to the atom on the other side. If it's a lone pair, on the other hand, we assign both electrons to that atom. So uh, Rule one, take the sum of the lone pair electrons and one half of the shared electrons. In other words, the ones that are in bonds. And then you subtract those, which they're calling assigned electrons. Subtract those from the valence electrons if the atom were a neutral atom. Next slide. All right, so let's do this together. POCl3, um, I'm going to do exactly what I just said for each of these atoms. So let's start at the top, Cl. Uh, Cl is in the seventh column, so it would have seven valence electrons. So first of all, subtract the number of lone pair electrons. So seven minus six is one. And then subtract half of the number of the bonding electrons. So we have two bonded electrons between the Cl and the P. So half of two is one. So 1 minus 1 would be 0. So the formal charge for that top chlorine would be 0. It will also be 0 for the middle chlorine, and it will also be 0 for the bottom chlorine. So all of the CLs are going to be 0. Uh, look at the O on the right. O typically would have an oxidation state of 6. Uh, so start with that and subtract the 6 lone pair electrons that are around it, so 6 minus 6 is 0, and 0 minus half of 2 would be 0 minus 1, which would be negative 1. 
so that O will have a formal charge of negative 1. Now, be careful and don't confuse formal charges that we're doing here with actual charges. These are not actual charges. They're just a, a special thing that we do for the purposes of Lewis dot structures. And then the last thing is the P in the middle. Uh, so P would typically have five valence electrons. Subtract the lone pair electrons. Well, there are no lone pairs on the P. So five minus zero would still be five. And then subtract half of the eight electrons around it in bonds. So two, four, six, eight electrons in those four bonds around the P. Half of that would be four. So five minus four would be plus one. Okay, so the P would be plus one, the O would be negative one, and the CLs would all be zero. What do you get when you add the plus one for the P to the negative one for the O? You get zero. And you notice there's no charge on this molecule, so we should get zero when we add everything together. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here P is 5 minus 4. Next slide. O is 6 minus 7, which is negative 1. Next slide. And CL is 7 minus 7, which is 0. Next slide. The sum of the formal charges of all the atoms must equal the overall charge on that species. In that case that we just did, it was 0. But in some cases, it will be like plus 1 or whatever. So everything added together will have to add to plus 1 if you have that situation. Next slide. Uh, so here we're back to what we talked about before with CO2. So notice here, that they've done it again. Uh, when we do the formal charges for the one on the right, uh, let me just run through. The, the one on the right we would have, for the O on the left, we would have uh, 6 minus 4 minus 2, which is 0. For the C, we would have 4 minus half of 8, which is 4, which would be 0. And for the O on the right, we would have 6 minus 4 is 2, 2 minus 2 is 0. On the left-hand side, the O on the far left would be 6 minus 2 is 4, 4 minus 3 is plus 1. For the carbon, we would have 4 minus 0 minus half of 8, which is 4 minus 4, which is 0. And for the O on the right, we have 6 minus 6 is 0, and 0 minus half of 2 is 0 minus 1, which is minus 1. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the one on the right will be more stable by far. Next slide. All right, so... Uh, kind of had to go a little quickly through some of this, but you can always stop it if you need to watch something or look at something more closely. Uh, that's most of what we need to know from this chapter, basically all. <clears throat> so just to go ahead and briefly mention what's going to happen in the next chapter, uh, we continue along this same vein. We're going to actually start to draw the different shapes here, not the way we did with Lewis structures, but actually we're going to try to imagine what they would actually look like in three dimensions. So we'll talk about three different theories, three different ways that you can do that. Uh, one is via CPR, and for that we just assume that everything gets as far apart as possible. Uh, and then we'll talk about valence bond theory, where we're talking about uh, the different ways that bonds form. Uh, and then we'll talk last about molecular orbital theory, which uses diagrams and you fill up the electrons and you see what you wind up with. All very interesting. So I think I'm at about one and a quarter hours, which is as long as I really want to go on a video. So I'm going to stop now. So hopefully this will help you. Uh, so I'll uh, uh, go ahead and uh, see you after this. Uh, we'll do the work problems for this chapter, uh, chapter eight, and then we'll move on to chapter nine.